the money. They uh, will change the uh, batteries in the slide pointer, but let's start without uh, uh, this one. And can we have a slide presentation now? Can we please put slides on the main uh, screen? Just one moment. Thank you. Uh, so, basically, in uh, cancer, uh, uh, in oncology audience, this is unnecessary to explain why predictive markers are needed, because actually, if you consider standard treatments, in many cases this is frontline treatment, in many cases this is second, third line treatment, generally it is more or less accepted only in oncology to have very low response rates to the treatment. And what is also important, cancer medicine is special because the majority of drugs are administered in maximal tolerated doses. So basically the adverse effects during ca cancer treatment look uh, rather like the norm than uh, an exception. And of course there is a need to match patients and the drugs, number one, to increase the efficacy of available treatment, and number two, in some cases, meaningful abstinence from the treatment, knowing that the tumor will respond anyway. It is also a rather meaningful option, which is quite unusual for medicine. This is rather cancer medicine, where toxic effects are somehow more important than the treatment effects. Uh, apparently, this is the first review on predictive tests. Look at the date. It was published 32 years ago, and it's related to mainly to endocrine treatment of breast cancer. And of course, the uh, endocrine treatment of uh, breast cancer is a prototype of all these predictive tests. Because uh, the majority of current predictive tests are, uh, rely on continuous variables. And when you deal with continuous variables, it is very difficult to define what is positive result, what is negative result. There is a significant number of instances where the results are intermediate, ambivalent. And what is uh, also important is that continuous variables are more prone to inter-observer, inter-laboratory variations than other tests. For example, consider immunohistochemistry. This is apparently the most important method in predictive oncology. Uh, Immunohistochemistry is considered to be simple, at least it is well available everywhere, but uh, it is a rather complex test. Look, here is a cell which expresses antigens, and here is a specific antibody which interacts with the target. So this is one reaction, but to see this reaction, you need to involves a second antibody which contains a label. So at least these are two complicated biochemical interactions which are prone to antibody storage, which are prone to temperature, and even more important, immunohistochemistry usually does not have a built standard. So the most critical factor is here a tissue processing, which may differ from one laboratory to another. And as a result, immunohistochemistry as a many tests which are related to continuous variables has insufficient, less than good interlaboratory reproducibility. Look, this is the most established assay. This is estrogen receptor detection uh, for breast cancer, I think the most common test in predictive oncology. But even here, uh, at least there are two parameters are considered. The number, the frequency of the stainless cells. And second, the intensity of the stainless cells. Of course, it is difficult to confuse extremes. But intermediate values, they, of course, subject to variation because to estimate the percentage of stainless cells. Uh, this is complicated because different parts of the tumors may have different proportion of stainless cells. And further, intensity of staining, this is also a kind of subjective parameter. And for that reason, the threshold 
what is considered to be positive value, uh, where there is a need to administer endocrine therapy, and what is considered to be a negative value is uh, still a disputed question, because, for example, this is a landmark study which basically established the cutoffs, what is considered to be estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative. It was performed on already at the time that it was impossible, ethically impossible, to have a control. Look, all these patients received endocrine therapy, adjuvant endocrine therapy. And therefore, even here in this uh, trial, in these studies, there is a mix of predictive significance of the test and prognostic significance of the test. Receptor positive uh, tumors fare better even without treatment. So this is really a challenge to define uh, some algorithms which are related, which are, uh, guide the decisions. Once again, it is uh, receptor determination is considered to be a routine, but even here some unexpected discoveries. For example, progesterone receptor, which is considered to be a, just a supplement to estrogen receptor testing. Progesterone receptor was uh, always considered to be just a marker of function of estrogen receptor pathway. So it was believed for a long time that progesterone receptor just a member of estrogen signaling cascade. This is a recent study that showing that uh, progesterone receptor probably has a tumor suppressor function, at least in some circumstances. So progesterone receptor, when activated, not stimulates the growth of breast cancer cells, but instead suppresses the growth of breast cancer cells. And if these data are confirmed, these predictive tests may significantly change because the interpretation will be different. What is more rewarding, at least for laboratories, is to run the test for predictive mutations. Predictive mutations, uh, these are nucleotide changes, they change the conformation of the protein. And because of that, the target becomes sensitive to the drug. Contrary to expression tests, mutation either does exist or does not exist in the tumor. There is no basically intermediate values. And that makes interpretation of tests very simple. And uh, now having a approximately 10 years of uh, clinical experience of uh, using mutation tests. Uh, these tests are uh, more popular and better known than many tests related to continuous variables. Uh, look, this is uh, our study, uh, which, uh, was, uh, which occur was occurring about 10 years ago. And uh, when we initiated this study together with Professor Moisienko, uh, the major intention was not only to achieve clinical efficacy, but also to reduce the spending of the drug, to make the spending of the drug more meaningful. And this, uh, look, these are patients which are selected on the basis of EGFR mutation, and only these patients do receive gefitinib. In this case, none of tablets are wasted. All patients with mutation who receive the drugs benefit from the treatment. And this is a typical situation for the majority of predictive mutation tests when it concerns sensitivity of the drug. What is the difference in terms of interpretation of the results? I would say this is virtually impossible to get false positive tests. It's necessary. The laboratory has to make a really bad mistake to produce false, posit false positives. So this is related to, normally to contamination or just mixing of the samples, confusing of the samples. But false negative, false negative tests for mutation testing are relatively common. The, mon the most common mistake is failed dissection of the tumor cells. Most of tests depends on the quantity, proportion of tumor cells which serve as a source of DNA. And several times a year, we are involved in dispute uh, with central laboratories for clinical trials when we detect mutation in the patient, and then this patient applies for the clinical trial, and mutation test is repeated by centralized laboratories somewhere in Europe or in the United States. And 
several times per year, we have disagreement when we detect mutation and the centralized laboratory doesn't detect mutation. We normally write a letter, and I have a few of such instances every time we were basically right. Repetitive tests uh, confirmed the presence of mutation. And I'm rather sure that this is rather a technical fail failure of microdissections and something else. Another common source of false negative results is the spectrum of mutations. Most of laboratory tests are done by commercial kits. And most of commercial kits capable to detect most common mutations, but normally miss the less frequent mutation. For example, EGFR mutations, which make tumor sensitive to gefitinib, erlotinib, afatinib, and some other kinase inhibitors. This is well known that deletions in exon 19 make tumor sensitive to the treatment. But what is less known, that also not deletion, but the opposite event, insertion in the same exon, also make tumor sensitive to the same drug. But if all deletions are basically detected by commercial tests, uh, insertions, opposite rare, rare event, cannot be detected by the same commercial test. And for example, look, here we managed to attract three patients with insertion to receive gefitinib, but it took to test 2,500 patients just to get these uh, three instances of insertion of exon 19. This is 1%, only 1% of EGFR mutation, but if these patients would undergo regular testing, they would be missed. They would not receive the drug. Another example, even more common, for example, melanoma inhibitors, they were initially developed to target most common mutation of BRAF, uh, V600E. This is the most common mutation in melanoma. The second mutation, this one, is considered to be rare. And this is actually true. This mutation is rare, and it was not, not initially included in BRAF testing kits, at least in the majority of kits. And if you consider overall population of the patients, I agree, this mutation is rare. But if you consider specifically elderly patients, one quarter of BRAF mutations belong to this type, and this type is often missed by commercial assays. So there is a number of mutations which render drug sensitivity, and there is a lot of enthusiasm around this field. But uh, what is, uh, should be recognized that basically one slide is fairly enough to accommodate all predictive drug synthesizing mutations and all predictive tests. Basically, there are EGFR mutations which are limited to lung cancer. There are ALK translocations which occur in lung cancer but also occur in some rare tumor types like myofibroblastoma, fibroblastoma in children. There are some other mutations which remain to be rather experimental, so they are not uh, really approved, but nevertheless, the number of mutations which render sensitivity to specific drugs is relatively moderate or even low. There are also mutations which have totally opposite predictive significance. If colorectal tumor has KRAS or NRAS, or perhaps a BRAF mutation, there is basically null probability that the tumor will respond to EGFR inhibitors. So the negative predictive value of this mutation is excellent. The problem is with positive predictive value, because if you consider so-called triple negative tumors, those who do not have KRAS, NRAS, BRAF mutation, still the majority of uh, tumors with this apparently favorable phenotype will not respond to monotherapy by EGFR inhibitors or will produce only marginal effect of this treatment. What is somewhat unexpected? I remember that a few years ago it was uh, considered that you don't, you no longer need organ verification of the tumor origin. If there is a predictive mutation, that's enough to administer the treatment. What is somehow uh, unexpected that at least some of predictive mutations uh, really act in the organ context. So they are helpful in some cases and they are not helpful in other instances. For example, this is a rare tumor, clear cell sarcoma. 
and uh, these patients did not have any treatment option left. And uh, when we made a BRAF mutation test, we were very happy because it is, uh, was uh, self-explanatory that this patient may receive benefit from BRAF inhibitors. And this is true. Look, this is complete response of sarcoma. Sarcomas rarely respond to their treatment. And this is complete response of sarcoma with BRAF mutation to vemorafenib. And a few days later, uh, we uh, the publish uh, the publication on basket trial landmark study on BRAF mutations. The study basket trial collected all tumor types with BRAF mutation and administered the same drug. And also here, look here's the second case of sarcoma, and it also responds very well to the treatment. But also there is a number of instances where, despite the presence of BRAF mutation tumor does not respond to the treatment. This is the role of organ talk, context. For example, if you consider cancer which affect gastrointestinal tract, this can be colon or some other cancers. In this case, BRAF inhibition is not sufficient. Why? Because there is a compensatory feedback mechanism. If BRAF inhibition is administered, colon cells or other gastrointestinal cancers respond by activation of EGFR, EGF receptor. And because of this compensatory signaling pathway, the tumor does not stop uh, despite uh, growing despite exposure to the drug. Here is a solution which comes from the knowledge of this mechanism of resistance. If two drugs are applied together, EGFR inhibition and BRAF inhibition, BRAF mutated inhibition, there is efficacy. And this is an example of tumor which is very difficult to treat. This is biliary, biliary cancer. And biliary, biliary cancers are notoriously resistant to all kinds of treatment. And here is a patient where BRAF mutation was identified. The frequency is very low, 2% of all patient population. But nevertheless, look, this is combined exposure to EGFR inhibitor and BRAF inhibitor, and this is a complete response of the tumor, which you would never see dealing with uh, patients uh, who have a tumor of biliary zone. Another interesting, uh, exciting area of, the clinic, of clinical research is hereditary cancers. It took some years to recognize that uh, hereditary cancers may indeed differ by pathogenesis from sporadic counterparts. And for that reason, hereditary cancers really may require different treatment. Here are some examples. The most known example is specific treatment for BRCA uh, driven cancers, but also, for example, Alexandra Yegermont already told about microsatellite deficiency. Microsatellite deficiency is highly characteristic for uh, tumors uh, with uh, hereditary colorectal cancer, Lynch syndrome, specific type of hereditary cancer. And these tumors are sensitive to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors but also some other relatively rare types of hereditary cancers which uh, also can be treated by specific therapies. Uh, apparently, the BRCA-related cancers are the most known examples, and this is partially due to development of PARP inhibitors because there is now a new class of drugs which specifically target hereditary cancers. Uh, the mechanism of specific drug effect in BRCA-related tumors relies on specific mechanism of tumor development. Look, this is a genome normal cells from BRCA mutation carrier. We all have each gene in two copies. One copy comes from mother, another copy comes from father, and one copy is mutated in every normal cell of the body because this is inherited mutation. But nevertheless, the human a human remains normal because there is another copy of BRCA gene which remains functional and it compensates uh, absence of, uh, it compensates the mutation. How a tumor does develop? The tumor develops due to inactivation of the remaining BRCA allele and that provides excellent therapeutic window for specific intervention. Tumor cells are DNA repair deficient while normal cells retain proficiency for DNA repair. And for example, these 
approach makes tumor sensitive to a very cheap and very simple drug. Cisplatin, platinum compounds, they are highly sensitive, uh, they are highly efficient for the treatment of BRCA-specific tumors. This is the first patient which came to uh, Vladimir Moiseenko with a uh, tumor lump which was insensitive to any kind of uh, standard breast cancer therapy. And as a last hope option, we made a BRCA test. And fortunately, we found BRCA mutation. And look, this is a pre-treated tumor which responds very well to very cheap and very simple drug cisplatin. And there is overview of studies. Uh, certainly, uh, platinum compounds are highly uh, efficient in these relatively unusual subset of breast cancers. This knowledge can be applicable to wide areas of oncology. For example, this is a study of gastric cancer. Number one conclusion from this study, unexpectedly, gastric cancer is a part of BRCA syndrome. So BRCA carriers, they are not only have elevated risk of breast and ovarian cancer, this is very well known, but BRCA carriers also have increased risk of gastric cancer, and this is less recognized. And number two, BRCA deficient tumors in other organs also have increased sensitivity to platinum treatment. And this sensitivity can be due to either germline mutation, this is hereditary cancer, but if RNA is suppressed due to somatic event, tumor does not produce BRCA protein due to other than inherited events, this tumor also is sensitive for cisplatin therapy. Cisplatin is not the only BRCA-specific drug. For example, mitomycin C, another forgotten, basically forgotten uh, drug which is uh, rarely used now in cancer therapy. It also has specific action against BRCA-driven tumors. And look here, these are heavily pretreated ovarian cancer patients who either became resistant to, become resistant to uh, platinum or cannot get platinum therapy because of adverse effects, and they are treated by mitomycin. Of course, there is no cure. I mean, this is still a palliative treatment, but nevertheless, this is significantly better than nothing. Nothing, this is still some effect. I think this is the most interesting observation which uh, we uh, had in uh, recent months. This is a neoadjuvant preoperative therapy of ovarian cancer patients. Many ovarian cancer patients, they get very short term three cycles, two months of exposure to platinum therapy simply to make surgery more achievable, more simple. And here are the study of patients who receive neoadjuvant therapy by platinum-based drugs. It is expected that patients with germline BRCA mutation respond to platinum therapy better than sporadic cases. Nothing new in that. But what is unexpected, the study of tumor biology during the treatment. Look, this is a tumor which was analyzed before the surgery. And as expected, we see perfect therapeutic window. We see the loss of the remaining allele. This is a tumor which is removed by surgeon two months after beginning of treatment, just during the surgery. What is the difference? The difference that tumor cells which were excised just two months after beginning of platinum therapy do not have loss of the remaining allele. They are DNA proficient, they have functioning BRCA allele, allele like these normal cells. This is selection, very rapid selection of the cells, which retain BRCA function. And this really changes, uh, may change uh, the whole culture of applying the treatment. Look, I mean, we all observed many times the reduction of tumor lumps. And we know that tumors are heterogeneous, but nevertheless, I personally, I always believe that when we observe reduction of tumor lumps, it more or less proportional event. Some 
cells are more sensitive, some cells are less sensitive, but nevertheless, during the tumor reduction, this is a very well understandable process. Unfortunately, it may be not true. If we consider our data, it looks like tumor sensitive cells die at the very beginning of the treatment. This is a very quick process. But what we see, we see that the room which is empty now is giving to rapidly growing resistant clones. So basically, just during the treatment, during the reduction of the size of tumor lump, there are rapid deaths of sensitive cells and also rapid division, rapid proliferation of resistant clones. This is important observation because, for example, if you consider neoadjuvant therapy for ovarian cancer, normally this is a biological test. If the therapy is efficient, uh, three cycles before surgery, then surgery is the same therapy applies after surgery, just to, as an adjuvant treatment. And I am not sure that this is the best strategy if we see that all cells which are removed by surgeon are already resistant to the treatment. This is unexpected how rapidly tumors adapt to the applied treatment. Another important issue, I remember very well the mid of 90s where we started to work with archival samples and when I submitting the papers to the journals, many reviewers were saying results are not reliable because DNA is degraded in archival material and all genetic tests you do cannot be trusted. Now it looks like a joke. Now biopsies are the standard resource for DNA and RNA analysis. But this is not sufficient nowadays because, for example, if you consider many patients, uh, they cannot tolerate well the biopsy because it's too traumatic and there is a need to make cytology. In some categories of patients, for example, prostate cancer patients, there is no access to the metastatic site, uh, sites. And for example, some of the co modern tests, they rely on circulating blood cells. And there is a boosting area of uh, tests which are based on analysis of circulated DNA. This is a challenge because the methods of molecular analysis have to be adjusted to the difficult tissue sources. For example, cytology is frequently done for lung cancer patients. And here we collected very unusual situations where the same patient has both cytological slide and archival sample biopsy. Normally, the initial diagnosis is done by, just by cytology and this uh, slide is stored, and then during the surgery there is more comprehensive analysis of the tumor. What is really surprising that even these cytological slides, which contain teeny amount of cancer cells, and which are stored for years without any precaution, not even DNA, but uh, also RNA, even RNA remains suitable for any kind of analysis. So this is really surprising that we can, uh, we can make the same kind of, the same quality of analysis from these old cytological slides. They are basically equal to uh, normal histological material. Uh, some tests are too cumbersome or not sufficiently automated or simply too expensive because of uh, involvement of commercial kits. For example, there are many actionable translocations, but the a way to detect uh, translocation is normally to make fish analysis. Fish analysis is not rapid, cannot be well automated, and requires purchase of expensive commercial kits. We relied on interesting uh, feature of some actionable translocations. What is the idea? When you have a translocation, the active part of the gene, active part of the enzyme, becomes overexpressed simply because the partner provides strong promoter, another type of regulation. So basically, when you have translocated gene, when you compare the quantity of kinase domain, active domain, and the quantity of uh, the beginning of the gene, normally this ratio is one to one, of course, in the norm because this is a single gene. But if you consider RNA expression of translocated gene, the active part of the gene is overexpressed. 
this is a very simple test because it can be done in the same pool uh, with the same pool of amino acids. So basically, you isolate both RNA and DNA in the same tube. You make one PCR test for EGFR and another PCR test for all translocations. There is no need to use uh, any kind of other technique. Here. And what is also interesting, just using this approach, we revealed that uh, many old translocations remain unrecognized uh, because FISH is a common diagnostic procedure and it does not identify the type of involved gene. In addition to single gene assays, assays there is a number of categories which are of, uh, concern more complex tests. For example, multi-gene expression scores, which is a quite popular tests, mainly they are used for uh, selection of patients who need or does not need to undergo a D1 treatment, but this is not the only example. For example, in prostate cancer, multi-gene tests are used to discriminate between patients who need treatment and who does not need treatment. Uh, Multi-gene tests, at least uh, they are performed in centralized laboratories. So despite this is a very challenging technique, your inter-laboratory reproducibility is not an issue in this case of tests. They normally supplement morphological diagnosis, but uh, the major question, if you do, let's say, comprehensive morphological diagnosis, for example, you count the number of proliferating cells and measure the same parameter by gene assay, where is the added value? I mean, definitely expression test provides some added value, but definitely there is some overlap with conventional comprehensive morphological analysis. I like the approach that some experts in the field say uh, the advantage of this test is that they can be automated. So who knows, maybe in some future, this test will replace some types of cumbersome uh, mor uh, morphological analysis. Multi-gene sequencing. The idea of multi-gene sequencing is to find actionable mutation in unusual tumor. For example, all lung cancers, they are ex uh, diagnosed for EGFR mutations. But if you consider uncommon tumor types, they are not subjected to EGFR testing. And the idea of these multi-gene sequencing panels to find unusual mutation in unusual organ. Of course, this is done irrespective to the organ context and also overall number of somatic mutations which uh, can be detected by exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, correlates with response to uh, immune modulators. Just this is the pre-last slide. Uh, another type of tests which are more biological, more functional. For example, there are attempts to obtain cell lines from tumors and to study the drug sensitivity for these cell lines. The critical disadvantage of this assay is that not all tumor cells can grow in the culture. There is selection in favor of the cells, subclones, which are capable to grow in the culture. And for that reason, there is uh, imperfect overlap between drug sensitivity in tumor and drug sensitivity in vitro. Even more complicated approach to use tumor-derived xenografts. Part of the tumor is transplanted to immunodeficient mice. This is more physiological, but disadvantage that tumors do not have immune system. And now it is getting clear that immune system contributes a lot even to response to conventional cytotoxic drugs. And what is even more elegant, there are some attempts to perform assays based on intratumoral injection of the drugs. So there is a patient with the tumor, there is a specific device uh, which perform micro-injection of various cancer drugs into the tumors, and then morphologist assesses the degree of the response. And uh, just as conclusion, Despite this area is very popular and uh, despite all this enthusiasm, we need to acknowledge that the number of truly predictive practice-changing tests is still limited. 
there is absolutely no progress in developing the test for old cheap drugs, for, for cytotoxic drugs. Mainly the tests are developed for those drugs which are recently introduced, and uh, most of these tests uh, serve as a companions uh, to uh, industry-sponsored trials. I think it is still under-recognized that tumor plasticity during the treatment, tumor, a selection of the uh, various subclones of tumors is very rapid. And for example, here there are some actionable mutations. Here is a second mutation which occurs in response to the treatment, and there is a new generation of the drugs which specifically target this mutation. And uh, of course, uh, we all expect significant progress uh, in this field due to invention of whole genome sequencing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eugenie. Uh, just you're brilliant as as always. Uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Uh, FDA has recently registered the liquid biopsy for registered GFR mutations. On uh, they presented the results of GFR te FGFR testing in urine, and the sensitivity of this method corresponds to the sensitivity of the method with the um, liquid biopsy in blood. What is the search about? I mean, the possible the search for finding a GFR mutation. Why? Why? Why is this happening? To uh, respect uh, uh, the. Uh, question. Uh, uh, if we speak about well, liquid biopsy, there are very good pro and contra arguments. Uh, in my point of view, the best pro argument is that when there are a lot of metastatic, you know, uh, sources, uh, it could be very effective. Uh, there is a belief which has never been proven that the liquid biopsy gives you a common analysis of all, you know, the metastatic uh, nodes. Uh, but honestly speaking, I have a feeling uh, that uh, the biopsy is very good when the researcher knows the status of the tumor. When the statuses are well known, then the concordance between the results of liquid tests and the tumor test results, the, it's not very well, you know, corresponding. And honestly speaking, I don't see any technical problem, the same PCR or DNA. Um, for now, I, uh, I am interested in liquid biopsy uh, not that much. And I'm quite surprised to see people becoming so fond of that because when it's becoming so serious that, well, it comes up to changing, you know, the whole treatment, it's easier to do cytology. It's not that invasive uh, procedure. I agree with you 100%. So this uh, trepan biopsy, for example, this morphological analysis, um, trepan biopsy gives us a chance to make immune uh, the chemical analysis. And uh, well, because sometimes it's about second and third tumor. We have just one more question. Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant uh, speech. Uh, my question is, how important the methodological aspects of, the new, of these approaches, uh, are those important? I mean, after the pembrolizumab um, adoption, uh, approval, sorry, uh, there were a number of discussions about various tests to find out the expression of PDA1. So what is your opinion whether, how can we choose the best uh, test? Is this a constant one or it is a volatile? You know, you have asked me an, a very uncomfortable question. Because first, there is still a huge gray zone when there is clearly positive or clearly negative result it's it's quite easy it's a huge reproductivity but this is a there is a huge gray zone but the reproductivity is is better when there is a centralized test which means monopoly by the way which is which makes me very uncomfortable uh, theoretically, I believe the future is uh, for the, the automatic tests that do not rely on human, at least. But for now, I don't have any response to you. I don't have any ideas. Any more questions? Uh, 
No. Well, thank you very much. And now we are, you know, uh, wrapping up our last session. We have uh, a break. Let's go to a break. Just a couple of words. Thank you very much for coming. I, I really thank you. Thank the lectors. And well, uh, you are wonderful. And we continue in a couple of minutes. <laughs> 